God, as we truly do believe our God is here with us in word and sacrament, and ourselves here gathered. So mindful of that, let us sign ourselves in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. May the grace and peace of our risen Lord Jesus Christ be with all of you. Amen. As we enter into the celebration of this sacrament, let us prepare our minds and our hearts for the experience of our encounter with our God. Nor that we might rightly do so, let us seek from that gracious God the blessings of his pardon and of his peace. I confess. sins and bring us unto life and love everlasting. Amen. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Let us pray. O God, who by the abundance of your grace give increase to the peoples who believe in you, Look one a favor on those you have chosen and clothed with blessed immortality, those reborn through the sacrament of baptism. Through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. A reading from the Acts of the Apostles. Observing the boldness of Peter and John and perceiving them to be uneducated, ordinary men, the leaders, elders, and scribes were amazed and they recognized them as companions of Jesus. Then they saw the man who had been cured standing there with them. They could say nothing in reply. So they ordered them to leave the Sanhedrin and conferred with one another saying, what are we to do with these men? Everyone living in Jerusalem knows that a remarkable sign was done through them and we cannot deny it. But so that it may not spread any further among the people, let us give them a stern warning never again to speak to anyone in this name. So they called them back and ordered them not to speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus. Peter and John, however, said to them in reply, whether it is right in the sight of God for us to obey you rather than God, you be the judges. It is impossible for us not to speak about what we have seen and heard. After threatening them further, they released them, finding no way to punish them, on account of the people who were all praising God for what had happened. The word of the Lord. Responsorial Psalm. I will give thanks to you, for you have answered me. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his mercy endures forever. My strength and my courage is the Lord, and he has been my Savior. The joyful shout of victory in the tents of the just. I will give thanks to you, for you have answered me. The right hand of the Lord is exalted. The right hand of the Lord has struck with power. I shall not die, but live and declare the works of the Lord. Though the Lord has indeed chastised me, 
yet he has not delivered me to death. I will give thanks to you, for you have answered me. Open to me the gates of justice. I will enter them and give thanks to the Lord. This is the gate of the Lord. The just shall enter it. I will give thanks to you, for you have answered me and have been my Savior. I will give thanks to you, for you have answered me. according to Mark. When Jesus had risen early on the first day of the week, he happened first to Mary Magdalene, out of whom he had driven seven demons. She went and told his companions who were mourning and weeping. When they heard that he was alive and had been seen by her, they did not believe her. After this, he appeared in another form to two of them, walking along on their way to the country. They returned and told to others, but they did not believe them either. But later, as the eleven were at table, he appeared to them and rebuked them for their unbelief and hardness of heart. Because they had not believed, those who saw him after he had been raised. He said to them, Go into the whole world and proclaim the gospel to every creature. The gospel of the Lord. Praise you, Lord Jesus Christ. During this conference, we have been talking about what it means to be a man of God and a loyal son of the church. A few years ago, I got a lesson in what it means to be a loyal son of the church when I was speaking at a family conference in California. And the keynote speaker that summer was one of the most extraordinary men that I've ever known. Bishop Andrew Francis of the Diocese of Moton, Pakistan. Bishop Francis has been in the Catholic News recently for advocating the cause for canonization of Shabazz Bati. Shabazz Bati was the Catholic cabinet minister, the only Christian member of the Pakistani government who was ambushed, shot and killed by Islamic militants back in March of last year. Shabazz Bati was targeted by Muslim radicals for his courageous, outspoken defense of human rights, the rights of Christians, the rights of women and the poor, and especially for his criticism of the country's so-called blasphemy laws, which essentially make it a crime to openly profess any faith other than Islam. Now, Shabazz Bati knew he was going to die, he had gotten so many death threats. He told the bishops there he knew he was going to be assassinated. It was only a matter of time. But he told them that he was ready, ready to give his life for Christ. Shortly before his death, he issued a statement to the Christians of Pakistan. 
He said this, I have been asked to put an end to my battle, but I have always refused, even at the risk of my own life. My response has always been the same. I do not want popularity. I do not want positions of power. I only want a place at the feet of Jesus. I want my life, my character, my actions to speak of me and say that I am following Jesus Christ. This desire is so strong in me that I consider myself privileged whenever in my combative effort to help the needy, the poor, the persecuted Christians of Pakistan, Jesus should wish to accept the sacrifice of my life. I want to live for Christ and it is for him that I want to die. I do not feel any fear in this country. Obviously, the martyrdom of Shabazz Bati is being taken very seriously in Rome. The Vatican Secretary of State has announced that the Bible that belonged to Shabazz Bati is now being kept there in Rome as part of a collection honoring the martyrs of the last century. So it would seem that soon enough Pakistan is going to have a saint. His great advocate is Bishop Andrew Francis. Now, before I met Bishop Francis, I knew a little bit about Pakistan. I've heard it said that Pakistan is now one of the most dangerous countries in the world. Pakistan has got nuclear weapons, but the country is unstable. The government is unstable. The nation is in constant turmoil. There is a growing, ever more violent Islamic fundamentalist movement and a terrorist insurgency that is getting stronger by the day. The Christian minority there is being persecuted. There have been many murders, many churches burned or bombed, church leaders marked for assassination. Our Catholic brothers and sisters in that part of the world now live in fear. Now, I knew very little about Bishop Francis. I had heard that he himself had survived an assassination attempt. And I know that things there are not getting better, they are getting worse by the day, and the odds of his survival are not good. And I had developed some preconceived ideas about what Bishop Francis would be like. I thought that anybody in his situation, a man marked for death, would have to be someone of very grave demeanor, deadly serious, somber, somber mood. I mean, here is a man who, in all likelihood, has got one foot in the grave. He's a dead man walking. But when I met him, I found that he was not like that at all. <laughs> in fact, he was exactly the opposite of what we were expecting. He was joyful. He was personable. He was laid back. He was witty. Great sense of humor. Quick with a joke. He invited a couple of us priests to have lunch with him that Saturday afternoon and we found him to be just great company, a man of deep faith and great learning. And we were so impressed with him that you couldn't help but think that here is a man who radiates Christ, a peaceful, joyful spirit in spite of it all. And when I was with him all the while I was saying to myself, how can this be? How can he be the way that he is? How can he be so cheerful, so relaxed, so upbeat, obviously so much at peace when his world is so full of turmoil, danger, persecution, death? How can it be? I thought about this and then it hit me. The answer came to me. I understood. I thought of the words of the Apostle St. Paul. The life that I live now is no longer my own. It is no longer I who live, it is Christ living in me. St. Paul wrote from imprisonment in Rome, awaiting execution. Rejoice always, I say it again, rejoice. I thought, here is a bishop, a man truly after the heart of Christ. Here is a man filled with the Holy Spirit and power. A man who radiates the joy, the love, the peace of Christ. This, my brothers, is the mark of a God-dominated personality. A 
transforming power of grace on a soul indwelt by the Holy Spirit, a true love that casts out fear. He's got it. He's got it all. Now, when Bishop Francis spoke at the conference, he told a story that I'll never forget about a boy in his diocese, a 10-year-old boy named Shalom Admali. Now, this boy, Shalom Admali, had just received the sacrament of confirmation. He had been confirmed by Bishop Francis. And this kid was on fire with the grace of the Holy Spirit. He had this anointing in the Holy Spirit, and he just couldn't contain himself. He couldn't keep it to himself. He had to share that faith, that fire, that truth with everyone that he knew. He had to tell everyone about Jesus. Now, Shalom Admali lived in a predominantly Muslim village where the Christian and Muslim boys still played together. And he was telling his friends about Jesus and talking about what he had learned at his catechism and singing the hymns that he knew. And the Muslim boys went home and they told their parents what they had heard from Shalom. And the parents went and told the local Muslim clerics, the mullahs. The mullahs became enraged. They saw this as proselytizing. Now, proselytizing by Christians is a very serious crime in Pakistan, a crime punishable by imprisonment. But that wasn't good enough for the mullahs. They wanted this kid dead. So they trumped up the charges against him. They accused the boy of blasphemy, defaming and insulting Islam and the Prophet, a crime punishable by death, death by hanging. So 10-year-old Shalom Admali was arrested along with the adult males in his family. They were put into prison and put on trial for blasphemy. Bishop Francis and the other bishops of Pakistan sounded the alarm. The word went out to Catholics and Christians all over Pakistan to pray. Catholics gathered in their churches all over the country to pray, to pray before our Lord in the Blessed Sacrament, to pray for justice and for the protection of this boy and his family. When the day of the trial came, Bishop Francis and some priests of the diocese the members of the boy's family went together to the courthouse. To get into the courthouse, they had to make their way through an angry mob. A hostile crowd of about a thousand men, all men, stirred up into a fever pitch. Their hands raised in the air and clenched fists, pumping, chanting, death, death, death to Shalom Mali. The case was tried by a panel of secular judges who, by the grace of God, saw through the falsehood of the charges, the malice of the mullahs. Shalom Admali was acquitted in, along with the members of his family and set free. While the boy and his family were on their way home as they stood and waited at a bus station, a gunman opened fire on them. Shalom Admali was hit, badly wounded. A member of his family was killed. Bishop Francis went to visit the boy in the hospital and they talked together and prayed together for a long time. The bishop asked the boy what he was going to do when he got out of the hospital, what he wanted to do when he got home. And the boy answered without hesitation, I'm going to tell everyone about Jesus. Brothers, I'll tell you in all honesty, it makes me shudder. It makes me shudder when I think of the courage of that boy. That ten-year-old boy is more of a man than I am. He is a more loyal son of the church than I am. That little boy, in the face of persecution and imprisonment and death, could not be intimidated, could not be shamed, could not be cowed into silence. That was the depth of his love, the love that casts out fear. 
But I think of our Catholic brothers and sisters in that part of the world and so many other parts of the world. Facing persecution every single day, I wonder, I wonder, my brothers, how many of us would be ready to imitate their example, their courage, their virtue. And I ask myself the same question I'll ask you here and now. What are we afraid of? What are we afraid of? Why do so many of us, and when I say us, I mean Catholics in general, Catholics in America, fail time and time again to stand up, speak up, to defend the cause of Christ? Why is it that time and time again, the culture of death seems to prevail over the culture of life? We are members of the mystical body of Christ. We rightly call ourselves the people of God, the people whose God is God, and we say, if God is for us, who can be against us? So, what are we afraid of? Why do we allow ourselves to be intimidated by the secular, agnostic, pagan culture that we live in? Why is it so many Catholics and Christians are content to sit back stand by idly and watch the pagan conquest of this country. Please, fellas, don't tell me that it's all different now. Please, don't talk to me about political correctness. Don't just tell me we're living in a pluralistic society. Leave it at that. God help us. You know what? It's like... We are concerned with everyone's opinion but God's. We're afraid of offending everyone but God, so it seems. But you know, the world will tolerate everything and everyone but Christ. Christianity, the church, the truth. Jesus said, if you deny me before men, I'll deny you before my Father in heaven. He said, heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. So, brothers, what are we afraid of? Let's not kid ourselves, huh? Things in our country, spiritually speaking, are not getting better. They are getting worse. And I say to you again, time is not on our side in this. It is late in the game. All this time we've been talking about the spiritual battle of our time. Well, I would suggest to you the spiritual battle is very quickly becoming the spiritual massacre of our time. There's an old saying, freedom is not free. And don't think what has happened in other countries cannot and will not happen here. Every priest that I have spoken to in the past year is in agreement that persecution is coming to the church in America. It is only a matter of time. In the Bible, the Apostle St. James wrote that our life on this earth is like a mist. It is like a vapor that appears for just a short time and then vanishes. Life is short. It's too short. Short for all of us. We have come from God and we are going back to God and that means that every moment we are in this world is somehow precious to us because at every moment we really are making and shaping our eternal destiny. That is to say, we are making ourselves to be what we will be forever by the choices that we make here and now. So brothers, You've gotten your marching orders this weekend. <laughs> Make the most of the opportunity. Make the most of the gift of faith, the gift of life, the gift of time that God has given to you. The time to store up your treasure in heaven is now. The time to be reconciled with God and with your neighbor is now. The time to give of yourself to others is now. 
The time to cast out fear is now. The time to stand up, speak up, rise up in charity is now. The time to make a new commitment to Jesus Christ and his church and his gospel is now. Don't put it off. Don't put it off to tomorrow. Because you know, for many of us, tomorrow never seems to come. And before you know it, life will pass you by. Time to answer God's call is now, and if you will do that one day, you will have the joy of hearing our Lord say to you, Come, you blessed of my Father, and inherit that kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. Let us rise in prayer. This minute, God, let us place these petitions before our gracious Lord. For our Holy Father, the Bishop of Rome, his brother bishops, God's living and loving spirit will continue to instill them to lead us on the ways to the kingdom. We pray to the Lord. The Lord hear our prayer. Let us seek the intercession of those who will be made saints tomorrow, John the 23rd, John Paul the Second, that through their example and their intercessions we may be the people that we are called to be as men of faith, hope, and love. We pray to the Lord. The Lord hear our prayer. Lord will give to his church more who will open up their minds and hearts and lives and love and service to God and his people as a vocation. We pray to the Lord. The Lord hear our prayer. For all those who struggle with their faith, that by our example and our outreach to them and the grace of God, they may be strengthened on their ways. We pray to the Lord. The Lord hear our prayer. For the sick, for the suffering, for all those who seek God's healing, God's wholeness, we pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For all who have gone before us in the ways of Christ's peace and friendship, that they may know their place in the presence of the risen Lord, we pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For those petitions that we have placed in our baskets, for those petitions that remain in our minds and spoken upon our lips, for all of these, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. Lord our God, we gather before you as your sons, as your servants. Be with us. You know what the workings of our minds and our hearts. We place all our needs at your feet. Receive them and us. And allow us always to be in the company of your Son, Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. Gentlemen, as we uh, pass around the baskets for the final love offering, I just had a few uh, things I wanted to say and a few announcements. Um, to building the body of Christ. It's not, you know, one Catholic man. It's not even just the men in this building today. It's all Catholic men. And it's up to re us to reach out to those men and uh, bring them into the body of Christ. So that's, only, that's the only way we're going to get stronger. Um, so now I ask you, what are you going to do um, with what you took from this weekend? You know, think about that. Pray about it. What are you going to do? Um, I ask that you be a disciple for Christ. And uh, we're going to win this battle. Lord, I come, and I confess, and bowing here I find my hands. Without you, I fall apart. You're the one that guides my heart. Lord, I give you all I need you. 
whose faith and devotion are among you. For them we offer you the sacrifice of praise for they offer it for themselves, and all who are near them, for the redemption of their souls in hope and health and well-being, and paying their homage to you and to the eternal God living and true. Celebrating this most sacred day of the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ in the flesh and in communion with those whose memory we venerate, especially the glorious ever Virgin Mary, Mother of our God and Lord Jesus Christ, and Blessed Joseph, her spouse, your blessed apostles and martyrs, Peter, Paul, and Andrew, James, John, Thomas, James, Philip, Bartholomew, Matthew, Simon, and Jude, Linus, Cletus, Clement, Sixtus, Cornelius, Cyprian, Lawrence, Chrysogonus, John and Paul, Cosmos and Amy, and all your saints, we ask that through their merits and prayers, in all things, we may be defended by your protecting help. Therefore, Lord, we pray, graciously accept this oblation of our service, that of your whole family, order our days in your peace, a command that we be delivered from eternal damnation and counted on the flock of those who have chosen. Therefore, Lord, we pray graciously accept this oblation of our service and that of your whole family, which we make to you also for those of you who have been pleased to give the new birth of water and the Holy Spirit, granting the forgiveness of all their sins. Order our days in your peace, a command that we be delivered from eternal damnation. Be pleased, O God, we pray to bless, acknowledge, and approve this offering in every respect. Make it spiritual and acceptable, so that it may become for us the body and blood of your most beloved Son, our Lord Jesus Christ. On the day before he was to suffer, he took bread in his holy and venerable hand. And with eyes raised to heaven to you, O God, his almighty Father, giving you thanks, he said the blessing, he broke the bread, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take all of you, and even for this is my body, which shall be given out for you. In a similar way, when supper was ended, he took his precious chalice and his holy and venerable hand. And once more, he gave you thanks, he said the blessing, he gave the chalice to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, and drink from it. For this is the chalice of my blood, the blood of the new the eternal covenant, which should be poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in memory of me. The mystery of faith.
us also, your servants, who, those sinners, open your abundant mercies, graciously grant some share and fellowship with your holy apostles and martyrs, with St. John the Baptist, Stephen, Matthias, Barnabas, Ignatius, Alexander, Marcellinus, Peter, Felicity, Perpetua, Agatha, Lucy, Agnes, Cecilia, Anastasia, and all your saints, admit us, we beseech you, into their company, not weighing our merits, but granting us your pardon through Christ our Lord. For whom you continue to make all these good things, O Lord, you sanctify them, fill them with life, bless them, and bestow them upon us. <coughs> Through him with him and him, O God Almighty Father, and the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory and honor is yours forever and ever.
Look with kindness upon your people, O Lord. Grant, we pray, that those you are pleased to renew by eternal mysteries may attain in their flesh the incorruptible glory of the resurrection. For we pray this through Christ our Lord. Amen. I want to take an opportunity just to thank all of you for the gift of your presence here. And knowing what a blessing it has been to you, to all of us, to all who made it possible, our speakers, our musicians, the team of volunteers. It's an incredible gift that they have given to us and that we give to one another and expected to give to one another as we leave here. The first reading today said that they were recognized as disciples of the Lord. May that be the title that everybody is able to see within us when we leave here today and every day that they will see us as disciples of the Lord. May the Lord God be with you. And be with your spirit. Bow your heads and pray for God's blessing. May God, who by the resurrection of his only begotten Son, was pleased to confer on you the gift of redemption and of adoption, give you gladness by his blessings. Amen. Amen. May he, by his redeeming work, you have received the gift of everlasting freedom, make you heirs to an eternal inheritance. Amen. And may you have already risen with Christ in baptism through faith, by living in a right manner on this earth, be united with him in the homeland of heaven. Amen. May the blessings of Almighty God come upon you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. The Mass is ended. Go in peace. Alleluia. Alleluia. Thanks be to God. Alleluia. Alleluia.